and welcome to Law Talk. My name is Lester Goethe, and this evening we are pleased to have as our guest Warren Perrin. Uh, Mr. Perrin is an attorney originally from the Henry E. Rath area who now practices in Lafayette. And the reason we have him on our program is we're going to talk a little bit of some, about something historical and yet something which has some current application. We talk about the complaint which he filed dealing with the Le, Le Grand Derangement. Uh, Warren, first, thank you for coming. Uh, exactly what did you do? In January of this year, Lester, I prepared and delivered a petition, a 25-page petition in the old way that uh, people presented grievances to government. I did not file this in a court of law, although I gave consideration to that. But I had it hand-delivered to Margaret Thatcher and to the Queen of England, and I asked in that petition for various things dealing with the Acadian exile, which occurred in 1755. Okay, what specifically did you ask him for? Did you ask him to send you a bunch of money, or? on behalf of the Acadians, or what specific remedy did you seek? When I first prepared this petition, I have to admit, I did ask for billions and billions of dollars and half of Canada back. But uh, as, as this idea evolved, I, I later changed my mind and never did ask, and still do not ask for any money. I believe that we can accomplish a lot more by approaching this, this problem, as I perceive it, more from a historical perspective more from a perspective of getting a declaration from the British government that the exile was improper, that it was contrary to human rights, and that it uh, has never been declared over. So as we are descendants of the Acadians, we still labor under that designation of being uh, de malfacteurs or criminals or people of ill repute because of what our ancestors allegedly done. Okay, so you're asking then for simp a simple declaration. The formal petition asked for, di for six different things, and I, I used those elements that the Acadians themselves had prepared a petition in 1763, and I used some of the things they had asked for from King George III, and I embellished it somewhat. Essentially, I asked for restoration of the status of French neutrals, for an inquiry into the Grand Derangement, for a declaration that the exile be declared over, and that for a declaration that it be, uh, that it has been done contrary to international or British law in existence at that time. All right, now let's let's go back and take a very simplistic approach. What is it that the is it that we're complaining about historically? For those who, who perhaps don't know what we're talking about, we talk about the Le Grand Derangement. What is it historically that that was done that you? Your, your complaint uh, addresses? The Acadians first settled in that portion of the world in approximately 1603. And in 1755, or some 150 years later, after these peoples had established and developed a very unique and distinct culture, they were uprooted, primarily, I allege, and most historians agree, because of the actions of their then Governor Charles Lawrence. And essentially, he took all of their property, their cattle, burned their homes, their churches, put them on boats, and dispersed, or the correct word is a diaspora of a people, or a scattering of a people throughout the world. Most of them were brought initially to the British colonies. And eventually, some made their way back to Canada. And as we well know, there's a very large group of French-speaking people in Canada today. But also a large group came to Louisiana at the invitation of the Spanish government, who took over Louisiana in 1770 or thereabout. Others returned to France, where they stayed for a while, tried to establish settlements, and eventually came to Louisiana. And a fourth group, after uh, they were exiled, went to some of the Caribbean islands, namely Haiti and West French Indies. So we have a large scattering of these peoples. And what I hope to bring attention to, and what my research revealed, was that it occurred contrary to then existing law. But it was not ordered by the British government per se. I think an analogy could be made with the, we're all familiar today with the Iran Gate, uh, or so-called trading hostages for weapons. And we know that men have gone to trial, and indeed Oliver North was convicted, along with some other individuals, for 
acting not on the orders of their government, but acting on their own and violating laws. And essentially, that's what I allege Governor Lawrence did in causing this exile of our ancestors. Now, I read uh, your complaint, uh, your well-worded complaint, I might mention, in the attachments, uh, the historical attachments, and uh, being a descendant uh, from these people, uh, you know, I came to a realization that, you know, I knew all along that something bad had happened way back then, but somehow put it in the back of my mind. And when I read the attachment, the, your, your complaint and the historical attachment to it, I, I became kind of somewhat angered. Did you, did you feel the same way? Certainly. And I've been um, somewhat lightly criticized by some editorial writers in Canada for um, perhaps overreacting to a historical event which is best viewed from a distance. But this all came to mind, Lester, when I was attempting to explain to my six-year-old the history of his ancestors. And you can't get around the fact, and he asked the question, well, Daddy, they were criminals? They got kicked out. I mean, you can't get around the fact that our ancestors are still labeled criminals from an historical perspective. I hope not only to have maybe had many individuals like yourself re-examine the history and maybe become a little more familiar with our history, but I hope to be able to get the British government or some other type of entity, perhaps, to erect some um, physical symbol, some symbol physique, as the Canadians would say, to commemorate the fact that the exile should be over with. We ought to put this bad period of our ancestors at rest and go on from there. What was the, uh, again, from a historical perspective, was there not some writing or letter which indicated that they were going to ask the French to take an unconditional oath of allegiance. And yet, uh, if they refused to do so, then they would kick them out. And of course, if they said that they were willing to do so, then they'd still kick them out. Certainly. It was a kind of a, an early catch-22. Certainly. The Acadians, by all accounts, were used by the British who occupied that part of the world. They found that particular area very strategic. It was a gateway to Canada. After the war and the Treaty of Utrecht was signed in 1713, they gave those Acadians an option of 12 months to leave if they wanted to, and they would buy their lands from them. Actually, they needed those people to stay because those people had developed a system of farms. They had a tremendous irrigation and dike system, and they could provide the food and supplies that the British soldiers needed in the forts because it wasn't easy to bring this across the ocean. Well. As time evolved and their system continued to evolve and they were very prolific and had a lot of children, they feared, be it real or feigned, that they were multiplying too quickly and that the British would never be able to establish an Anglo colony there because of these French people were prospering so well. And so you found that various governors used various strategies either to make them leave or make them stay. And they were never really given an opportunity to act of their own free will. Okay. Now, from a historical perspective, I know that the, the assertion you've made in your complaint is that this was, in a, a sense, a form of genocide. In other words, where a, a people, you get trying to get rid of an entire ethnic group uh, in a, a particular country. Uh, and, of course, uh, the, the other parallel you drew was that the fact that this was not even during wartime. This was during peacetime. That's one of the things that really got me thinking about I needed to do something. I started uh, in genealogy some 20 years ago and always had a, a, an interest in my ancestry, but I never really got into it until I started following the American-Japanese claim against the United States, which, by the way, was the first time that a government paid reparations or dollars and cents to an individual or a group of individuals for alleged human rights violations. And we see what's happened in the world in the last couple of years since then. I'm not saying that that's one of the reasons that we see the uh, East European communist countries falling like flies today or a South African situation changing or all of these changes in human rights. But I would like to think that we should never be afraid to examine past atrocities as the Holocaust which occurred to the Jews by the Nazis. These type of examinations, I think, perform a good service in the hopes that it will never occur again. And, and I'm, when I'm asked, why did you do this, I guess it goes back to, to the point that 
it was such a tragedy because when you look at the definition of genocide, Lester, you're absolutely correct. It's the deliberate destruction of a culture or class of people. And I defy any Briti pro-British historian to say that that is not exactly what Charles Lawrence set out to do. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, I think you, by your answers and your responses, you, you, you pretty well have indicated that you are serious about the, the subject matter. For example, I, I know that uh, I'm sure you face some degree of levity from certain circles saying, well, you know, isn't it a little bit late? You know, it, it happened in the 1700s and uh, now it's 1990. Aren't you a few hundred years too late to, to you know, to really make a legitimate complaint? What, how do you respond to that? I have documented approximately 14 instances where a group of individuals or, or people, as we would call them, a culture, have urged a similar thing that I'm urging today. That is, seeking either reparations or dollars and cents, or seeking an apology for certain atrocities. Uh, some people urge these months after they allegedly occur. Mm -hmm. Others go back hundreds. Others go back 50, 20, 30 years. We see today, uh, within the last few weeks, that the South Korean government successfully got from the Japanese emperor an apology for the atrocities committed as early as 1910. They received that apology. We see that the Poles recently received an apology from the Russian government for the forced labor camps during World War II. I mean, I can give you 14 other examples where this occurs. And in my opinion, it should never be too late to right a wrong. And it's easy to do this. And we need not blame our friends and closest allies in the world, the British government. Because as I state in my petition, and I try to make as clear as I can, this was not an official act of the British government. This occurred during a time of peace. There were many atrocities occurred in the history of mankind. But under the auspices of a declaration of war under international law, it's, it's OK. So the Acadian exile began in 1755, September 5th, and war between French and the English forces did not occur until May of 1756, or nearly a year later. So we do see that even under international law, in a time of peace, you cannot take the liberties that Governor Lawrence and his colonial forces did in confiscating all of their properties. I think there was also an element that if they thought that there were a few people who were perhaps uh, treasonous or disloyal, uh, then they should have made, uh, gotten a hold of those people, put them on trial, and not blamed everyone there. If uh, you uh, recall from reading the petition that I attached to my petition, which was filed by the Acadians who had been deported to Philadelphia, they say that they had not had an opportunity to legally address the issues and the claims which they claim were falsely raised against them. In other words, Charles Lawrence, in conspiracy with another individual, obtained an order exiling all Acadians for alleged high treason committed against the English crown. My position is, and I believe most historians will agree, even pro-British historians, that under then existing British law, you could become a, a convicted criminal for high treason, and the penalty would be death. But if you make the assumption that every Acadian man was engaged in, in activities, military activities, against the British government in favor of the French, which, of course, is ridiculous and never occurred. But if you make that assumption for the sake of this discussion, the penalty was execution for the man, but there was no penalty for the punishment of his family or confiscation of private property, which is precisely what occurred. So you didn't see just the punishment of the alleged wrongdoers here. You saw Charles Lawrence and his colonial soldiers banishing the entire family, seizing the entire farm, killing all of the cattle, and burning the houses. So an entire group of people, that's, by definition, genocide. And also, historically, um, bringing people down to the docks and apparently dispersing them on, on boats without uh, really any concern about who was in the member of this family or not, and, and, and breaking up families. And, and it, it, it evokes a horrible scene. It really does. Any time that these people came into contact with other groups or other ethnic groups, it seems as though, and we see this in South Louisiana today, rather than the other culture absorbing the French, the French seems to have always absorbed the Spanish, the Germans, the Italians. And 
the British became keenly aware of this, and they saw this as one of the difficulties in ever establishing a colonial foothold with an Anglo or British culture. And so that's one of the reasons they deliberately dispersed these people all along the British coast, along different colonies. In other words, they didn't come to Louisiana. That's one of the major misconceptions. Most people think that, oh, they voluntarily got on these cruise ships, came down to New Orleans, maybe parted on Bourbon Street, and came down to Happy South Louisiana, which is very far from the truth, of course. And um, that was a deliberate attempt to dilute the people, hopefully have the British culture along the coast there absorb them and eliminate the French influence in North America. Okay, what has been the response of the British to your complaint? I'm happy to say that uh, we've gotten, I have gotten a response from the government. I asked that they respond within 30 days. I told them if they would not respond, I would then file this petition in an appropriate legal forum. I'm happy to say I have not had to do that. I am in talks with representatives of the British government. I'd prefer not going into that because I think it would really do harm to really achieving anything because if they perceive that I'm doing this for publicity or trying to embarrass the government, I think they would shut it down right away and stop talking to me. So, but I am, I am very encouraged at this point. Is not one of the assertions or defenses that perhaps you're taking it up with the wrong people, the British, because uh, apparently because Canada used to be part of Britain and now Canada is independent. Canada, the Canadian government is now the successor to the British government and is not a, an assertion or something that's been thrown out that don't, don't, talk, don't tell the British, tell the Canadian government. Britain, of course, being the world colonial power that it was for so long, we all know the sun never uh, set on the British Empire for a number of years, uh, of course, has a lot of scars and a lot of wounds in, in many countries. And so their traditional approach has been exactly what you're alluding to, and that is to wash their hands, so to speak, of these alleged sins and basically say, you're talking to the wrong people, talk to our successor government, go see Brian Mulroney in Ottawa. Uh, they, the British did the same thing when the Canadian Indian tribes, I am told, asserted claims against them. I am hoping, though, that I will give Britain a chance to cleanse itself of this dark part of their history, because all historians agree this is one of the darker chapters in British colonial history. And we see today that Gorbachev, the leader of Russia, has such a high rating in the world because of the concessions he has made to human rights. I submit that the British, if we look at their embarrassment in Northern Ireland, their South African situation, the Falkland Islands, uh, the repatriation of the v Vietnamese boat people out of Hong Kong, we see that they take a real hard line on human rights. And maybe this might be an opportunity for them to be able to demonstrate to the world that they do have this strong, strong tradition and respect for human rights. And this would be a wonderful way of doing it because it was never ordered by the British government. But wouldn't it be wonderful to have the British people extend an open palm to the Acadian descendants and say, we wish it had never happened, and we declare it over? Okay. Now, you raised the issue about publicity, and, and, and I've seen even articles written of how initially you declined interviews on the subject while you were uh, in the process of filing the complaint and awaiting a response. But I know that since that time, you've had an opportunity to do some interviews, I know locally in an article in the Times of Acadiana. What kind of publicity and what kind of um, reception have you had, for example, in the Canadian press and among the Canadian people? Uh, to answer your question backwards, uh, I'm very pleased that the people of Acadiana have unanimously supported me. I've gotten many calls and letters and uh, people thanking me for bringing attention to this. And th there'll hopefully be some spin-off benefits tourism-wise. I've heard that Acadian Village is happy about this. People are inquiring. They want to see a copy of it. Likewise with Vermilionville and the Lafayette Parish Tourism Commission. But in no way is it as hot an issue as it is in Canada. I mean, we're talking front page news stories because of the separatist movement, which we saw a few years ago, the Quebec government voted on, and the more recent Lake Miche Accords, which uh, were to have been ratified by the 10 provinces unanimously, or it would expire. And recently, it was not ratified, and therefore, those accords have expired. So we find that the, the uh, Canadian people 
are just so interested because to these people and to those Akkadian descendants of these exiles that went back or managed to evade the exile, for them it's an everyday problem. I mean, they drive by those lands that may have belonged to their ancestors and were taken by Charles Lawrence's soldiers. They see it every day. They still tell me that although I've got tremendous support from deans of law schools and attorneys in the maritime provinces of Canada, uh, they cannot openly support it for fear of reprisals from the Anglo element in the business community. That would be economic reprisals. Absolutely, economic reprisals. But it's a very, very hot, burning issue. I frankly expected uh, to receive more criticism in the Canadian press, but it's for the uh, editorials that I've seen, it's generally run about four to one in favor. They like to see the approach that I've taken, that is simply petition a grievance, rather than marching in the streets or holding rallies and uh, burning flags and this type of thing. Uh, editorial writers have said this is a, a more um, sane way of approaching a historical problem. Well, now, Warren, have you, uh, have you suffered any economic reprisals as a result of bringing this complaint? other than the lost time in my office and my law partner screaming that's about me not working hard enough because I'm spending too much time on this project. That's the only reprise that's you've correct. suffered. Well, good. Uh, well, seriously though, publicity-wise, I know that uh, there are numerous articles that have been written, and isn't, isn't there something new that's, that's coming out uh, dealing uh, with your complaint? Yes, uh, National uh, Geographic magazine will do a feature on the Acadians in their October issue and I was uh, told two days ago that they would include this petition as an example and as a contrast between the Acadians in Louisiana and the Acadians in Canada. That is, the, the author of this Geographic magazine uh, article found that there's a much more volatile situation in Canada. In Louisiana, we're more distant. We take a more a slower approach to these problems, and he cites this petition as one of the examples of that. We also received um, very favorable coverage on National Public Radio show recently where they interviewed me about this and I was able to discuss our culture in Louisiana. So hopefully there's some good side benefits that flow from this and it's not viewed merely as an antagonistic adversarial approach to a problem. Okay, back to uh, something that you mentioned in, in, in trying to uh I guess connect what you're doing here with, with what is going on in Canada. Uh, I had an opportunity to go to Canada a while, a couple of months back, and uh, this, the, the discussions entitled the Meech Lake Accords, uh, which as you described was, was a, a document or an agreement in which the other provinces of Canada were being requested by the Quebecois, the, the people from Quebec, to recognize that the people in Quebec had a, quote, distinct society, unquote. And uh, unfortunately, at least at this time, it, it has failed to pass. The people in Quebec are very much not happy about it. In any event, every day, front page news. I mean, every slight change in the position of one of the provinces was front page news. It is very, it's a very important issue to all of Canada, not that the, the Anglos are as concerned with the French distinct society issue, but the point of the matter is, is that Quebec is, is threatening to leave Canada over the issue. And, it, and it's as, it, I guess it's as important as you can get. Absolutely. And I, I really haven't had a chance to digest the significance, if any, about what I'm about ready to mention to you, but uh, Professor Carl Brasso in his book, The Founding of New Acadia, uh, discusses Queen Anne's Edict, which was a directive from the then Queen of England when the uh, Treaty of Utrecht was signed and she was probably the most benevolent leader of the British government in her treatment toward the Acadians. And she signed something called Queen Anne's Edict. And in those uh, edicts, are, uh, three issues were addressed. And in 1713, June 23rd, which I believe is significant, may or may not be, ironic for sure, in exchange for those Acadians, swearing their allegiance to the British, they received uh, the status of French neutrals. They were also allowed to practice their Catholic faith, and most significantly of all, and I'm going to quote here so I won't get it wrong, 
and they, were, they received recognition by the British colonial government that the Acadians were, in fact, a distinct community. So what we find is, in 1713, or 277 years ago, Queen Anne of Britain conferred upon the Acadians the fact that they were a distinct community. And what we find as the most divisive thing dealing with the Lake Misha cards today is the fact that the Quebec people or the French Canadians want that recognized by the other provinces in Canada. And of course you realize that those accords expire on what day? June 23rd. And I've, uh, before we went on today, I attempted to find out whether there was any uh, significance between the two dates, and uh, so far as I've been able to determine from three different journalists, it was totally coincidental, but very ironic. A, a historical coincidence. Yes. Well, uh, Warren, where do you go from here? I mean, what, what does the future hold, or, or can you possibly predict what the future holds uh, for your complaint and, and your cause? I am in this for the long haul. We will achieve something. I'm not sure where we, we've taken many turns along the way, but as long as they are still taking this very seriously, which they are, I will continue to have discussions with British representatives. If and when they tell me they no longer want to discuss this, I will then be in a position to make a decision whether we will file in a formal court of law, and if so, whether it will be in Canada, in Louisiana, in England, or where it will be. And I have some help from some uh, international law professors who are quite interested in this as it relates to uh, filing claims for terrorism in the world today. And uh, they are, uh, I'm happy to say, willing to donate their time to help me in this regard. On the other hand, we see some other positive things developing. Uh, the dean of a law school in New Brunswick, the University of Moncton, Dean Michel Doucet, has invited attorneys and uh, scholars and judges from Louisiana to go and we're going this summer in August to spend seven days for a seminar where they want to share with us and they want us to share with them the experience that we've had with our Louisiana Civil Code which as you know we interpret in English and in Canada they're the exact opposite of us they have the old English common law which they study and interpret and practice in French so they're the exact opposite of, of ours and the significance of this is, in 1992, we see that the European countries are planning on joining together in a European common market, and they anticipate having difficulties with merging their laws together. And they want to draw from our unique experience and heritage in Louisiana, from having our basis law in France, or in French, and we interpret it in English. And so it's, it's very exciting to see some of these developments occurring as a spin-off from some of these contacts which we have with our Canadian cousins. Well, fine. Warren, uh, thank you very much for coming. It sounds very, it's, it's a real interesting subject, and, and I think it's uh, certainly a very interesting subject from, from the standpoint of, of young people who, who have no idea mm -hmm. you know, what, about their history and their culture, and we certainly wish you the, the best of luck, and, and we hope you prevail. Thank uh, you very in much, your cause. I'm Lester Gauthier. We've been visiting with uh, Attorney Warren Perrin, who has filed a complaint with the British government over the Grand Derangement, which took place in the 18th century, uh, hoping to seek uh, and to get some remedy in the declaration that the, that, that the uh, Cajuns, the Cajuns, or Cajuns' exile is over. And we certainly wish him the best of luck. Thank you. Good evening. This has been Law Talk.